Hi, I'm Mr. V. Today we're doing, we're practicing proofs. This is section 10 of chapter two in the illustrative math under the topic of congruence, practicing proofs. All of our activities are found in the, geo, uh, <clears throat> in the Google Classroom under the Desmos activity. So if you go to the Desmos activity, you can see where we start with practicing proofs. Um, the objectives of this lesson, by the end of the lesson, you'll be able to, I can use the side, 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 angle, side, angle, and side, angle, side, side, angle, side, triangle congruence theorems in proofs. And I can write conjectures about quadrilaterals. Before we begin the lesson, however, let's talk about some of the um, homework problems. In this, we're given a kite, and the, we're told that the kite has find my pen here. The kite has the measure of angle WXY is 133 degrees. So this is 133. And we're told that ZX, ZWX is equal to 60. So this angle is 60 degrees. And we're asked to find this angle down here, Z, um, ZYW. And this is Y down here at the bottom. So I'm going to call this angle one, because that's what we're looking for. We'll just call it angle one. If I knew these other two angles, I could find the angles by the triangle angle sum theorem. And although it doesn't ask you, I did ask students to explain to me how we could find this. What do we know about the angles of this figure, this kite? We know that we have two sides congruent here, because this is given. For every statement that you make, you have to have a reason or a rule to, to, go, to go with it. So for the statement, I'm going to say uh, side w, WZ is equal to WX. And the reason is because it's given. And this is one of my sides that's congruent from both of the two triangles. Here we have a side that is congruent to a side. And this is also given. So this is my second side. I'm given that yz is equal to yx. And that's because it's given. The reason is because it's given. Now, in class, we've talked about this many times. Here I've got a side that is congruent to this side. And the reason, there's a reason that goes with it. And can you tell me what it is? It's, gives me the side here that says WY is equal to WY. Um, it's important that you learn and recognize these reasons. This is the reflexive property. Not reflective, it's reflexive. Property. It's not a definition. It's not a postulate or a theorem. It's a property, just like the distributive property, the associative property. This is a property. Now I've got the side, the side, and the side of one triangle that is congruent to a corresponding side of the other. With this in mind, I could use the side, side, side triangle congruence theorem. And this is going to be something that we can use how would we use it? Well, we're using the shortcut to prove that the two triangles are congruent. So triangle WZY is congruent to, and I have to line up the angles. We have one tick, two ticks, three ticks, one tick, two ticks, three ticks. This would be triangle WXY. Make sure you line them up whenever you do this. Because I know that the two triangles are congruent, I can use a, this shortcut to show that all of the corresponding parts, all six of the corresponding parts, six of the parts that you can measure, the three angles and the three sides are congruent, not just the ones that are marked here. So I know that this angle is the same as this one. This is 133. And I know that this angle here is the same as this one. And this angle, I'll mark it with a tick, is the same as this one. So what rule allows me to say that angle Z is congruent to angle uh, X. It is that the corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. And I'll say it every time, but I'll abbreviate it, CPCTC. 
if I didn't say it, you might think I'm thinking candy treats, candy popcorn, candy treats candy. Here, I'll call this angle two and angle three. Angle two and angle three are equal to each other. And the whole angle, when they add them together, is equal to 60. So how much is angle two and angle three? Well, I know that if I add them together, I will get 60. And I also know that, because I were given that this was 60 degrees, we also know that angle two is congruent to angle three. Why? Because the two triangles are congruent, because of CPCTC. And since they are congruent, I can substitute this value in for three, because it's the same as three. So when you have two of angle twos is equal to 60, one of the angle twos is equal to 30. So this angle is equal to 30. So angle two is congruent to angle one. I'll mark this with a circle so you don't just think it's a number. That was um, because of CPCTC. And by using substitution, I get the measure of angle two is equal to um, 30 substitution. But we substituted it into this, this equation, <clears throat> knowing that the whole angle is equal to 60. Now the three angles of a triangle sum to 180. So I could write that um, angle one plus 30 plus 133 is equal to 180. And that's because of the triangle angle sum theorem, which says that the measures of the angles of a triangle sum to 180. And when you subtract from both sides, that's the subtraction property of equality, you get that angle one is equal to 17. And that's all I'm going to spend on this problem. Another homework problem is this one. This looks like a test question. We've seen this before in homework. Each statement is always true. So statement A is true, statement B is true, statement C, statement D, and statement E. These are all true. The question is, is the converse true? The converse has an if part and it has a then, just as the statement has an if and a then. What you're doing when you're doing these two arguments is you're switching the hypothesis with the conclusion. So here we have if two angles form a straight angle, then they are supplementary. And here we have, if two angles are supplementary, then they are a straight angle. So we just switch the two arguments. If this is not true, then look at the hypothesis as being true. Can you disprove the conclusion? Can you write a counter a counterexample? A counterexample is something where the con conclusion is not true. So, for example, straight angles uh, would be a linear pair. You'd have angle 1 and angle 2. And, of course, that means that they add to 180 because they're supplementary. And they do they make a straight line. Can you think of, do two angles have, that are supplementary have to form a straight angle? I could have one angle that's 90 degrees and a second angle that's 90 degrees that don't make a line and yet are supplementary. So this is false because I used a counterexample to explain why they don't form a straight line, straight angle. An isosceles triangle, the base angles are congruent. This is the pons asinorum, or the isosceles triangle theorem. If you have an isosceles triangle, then the base angles are congruent. And so the converse of that we've also proved earlier, where it is if you have an, a triangle where the base angles are congruent, then it must be isosceles. Yes, this is true. Check mark here. If a point is equidistant from two endpoints of a segment, so here's our segment we put a point that's equidistant from both of them, like this, then it lies on the perpendicular bisector. So this is perpendicular and it bisects this segment. And that is true. Of course it's true. That's what it says is true. The converse of this is the perpendicular bisector theorem. So the converse here is the, con is the perpendicular bisector theorem. And this is the converse of that. Perpendicular bisector theorem, theorem says if you have a point on the perpendicular bisector of a segment, then it forms an isosceles triangle with the endpoints of that, that segment. In other words, these two it's equidistant from the endpoints of that segment. So this is also true. If two angles are vertical angles, they are congruent. That is the vertical angles theorem, which we've proved. 
The converse is if two angles are congruent and they are vertical, can you think of two angles that are congruent that are not vertical? Well, we showed it before. If I have two right angles, what if I have uh, parallel lines and I have a transversal? The alternate interior angles are congruent. They're not vertical. What if I have just a 30 degree angle over here and a 30 degree angle somewhere else? These are not vertical angles. Vertical angles are non adjacent angles formed by intersecting lines. There's no intersecting lines here. And these don't form the vertical angles. This one and this one are vertical. So this is false. If two lines are perpendicular, then they intersect at four right angles. So if they're perpendicular, it means that they intersect at four right angles. All of these angles are right angles. Is the converse true? If I have two lines that intersect at four right angles, then the two lines are perpendicular, and that is true. Now let's look at the lesson. In today's lesson, a um, long time ago when I first started teaching, one of my students was in construction, and we got to talking about quadrilaterals, and he said, oh, I use this all the time. I said, how do you use it? He said, when I build a foundation, if it's going to be square, and he didn't really mean square, he meant if it's going to form right angles, so it was going to be a rectangular foundation, he would measure the diagonals. If the diagonals were congruent, then it's, it's not going to be slanted, it's going to be straight up and down. So um, maybe you've seen this yourself. Carpenters use diagonal braces all the time. This ensures that some things they're building that are supposed to be rectangular don't slant. Sometimes they use diagonal braces or pieces of wood to, or metal to go from corner to corner to help keep them straight. Have you ever experienced this? Have you ever used these before? So you can explain how you use them in this particular page. In today's lesson, we're making different kinds of figurations to see what kind of braces different shapes would make, but you can make them. And for example, I could take these two braces. They're not congruent. They look congruent. They're both seven dots, but five ones a little bit closer together. And here you made a ra uh, rhombus when we collect, when we put all the points together. We're going to explore that and find different ways that you can arrange them. So I want you to study this graphic organizer, which I created. This is graphic organizer of all of the family of quadrilaterals. Uh, in it, you have a red family, the red group, the yellow group, and the blue group. In the red is the trapezium. This is where no pair of opposite sides are, are parallel. In the trapezoid family, we have exactly one pair of opposite sides is parallel. And then there's the parallelogram where both pair of opposite sides are parallel. And in Europe, the definition for trapezium and trapezoid is exactly opposite. So if you look online and you research what is a trapezium, they might tell you the definition of a trapezoid. You have to be very careful with that. Also, some textbooks say that a kite can be a rhombus. We do not subscribe to that. I do not subscribe to that, not in this lesson, not in this group. So a rhombus is an equilateral quadrilateral. A kite has to be has to have two pairs of uniquely congruent adjacent sides by our definition. So with this in mind, we're going to um, look at and record your, your observations. I'm going to give a short demonstration, and then you're to look at and record your observations of what properties you can identify from the diagonals of a quadrilateral. And the second part is I'm going to give you the diagonals, and you're supposed to identify what quadrilateral it is by connect, connecting the endpoints. And there's things, four things for you to watch out for. Are the diagonals congruent? Are they perpendicular? Does one bisect the other? Do they both bisect each other? So we're looking for those four things. And I can show you this demonstration using this particular one. Here we have a geo board. And I've put these up here in the red family group, the yellow and the, and the blue. These are all of our quadrilaterals. To do this, you hang the one <clears throat> rubber band and you can stretch it like this. So I can hang it over here. And when, as long as it's the one that's highlighted, it'll stretch over this point. And you can connect each of these to the opposite, um, to, the si uh, to the opposite corner of the diagonal. Then you can tell me something about diagonals. For instance, on this one, this is a square. And if I connect the diagonals, what can you tell me about them? Well, they are congruent. 
So if I have congruent triangle, congruent diagonals, do I always get a square? And the answer to that is no. But there are other properties involved too. These are perpendicular. They will always be perpendicular. You have a 45, 45 angles here that split this in half, this 90 degree angle. So this is going to be 45, 45, and 90. Now, in addition to that, these bisect each other. So this is cutting halfway this line, and this one's cutting halfway this line. So those three properties will make it a square. If I had a rhombus, for example, I could say, well, the diagonals bisect each other. They don't necessarily, and they don't necessarily are congruent, but they bisect each other, and they're perpendicular. And when you did the, the uh, rectangle and you do this, you can make your own observations here. Notice these are not perpendicular necessarily, unless it's a square. But what can you say about it? And after doing this particular exercise, I left you a second one, which is where I gave you the, <clears throat> the diagonals. And you should try to guess what kind of quadrilateral this is. Here we have what looks like, I'm going to use a different color, blue maybe. Well, it looks like an isosceles trapezoid. And it looks like in an isosceles trapezoid, the diagonals are perpendicular because this looks perpendicular. However, this one is also going to make an isosceles trapezoid. And I do it and I connect it. Notice I can grab it here in the middle and stretch it over and I can grab this one and put it. This is also an isosceles trapezoid. The two sides are group, but these diagonals are not necessarily perpendicular. They just happen to be perpendicular. What figure do you think this one is? Let's try dragging our rubber band here. So when I do this one, I get a parallelogram. Oh, look, both of the diagonals bisect each other. Are they perpendicular? Not necessarily. They don't have to be. They could be, but not to be a general par parallelogram. Um, does one bisect the other, but the other one not bisect it? No, they both bisect each other, which is a different property. And so after playing with this and working with it, then we come to notice these things to, to synthesize this activity. And I had you write, say, if the diagonals, and you could say if they are congruent, then the quadrilateral is a parallelogram. So if they're congruent, maybe it's a rectangle. Maybe it's a, maybe if they are congruent and bisect each other, then the quadrilateral is a rectangle. And so here I've left some of the um, observations that you could have made about quadrilaterals. On this next part, we have a court card sort. And there you're going to start the swords, sort the cards once and explain why, you what your categories are into two groups. You're going to do it a second time and explain your reasoning. And then you'll do it where the, you sort the cards by rigid figures versus flexible figures. And you're going to then finally find at least one set of triangles that can be proved with the side angle side triangle congruence theorem, the angle side angle, and the side angle side. So here are the cards. And I don't know if you can see them very well, but that's okay. If you don't, you can always go to the to the um, <clears throat> actual Desmos file and look at it. And one student said, well, these ones have tick marks on it, so I'll put them all together. And this one's don't. These two don't. One said that this is a quadrilateral, this is a quadrilateral, this is a triangle, and these other two are quadrilaterals. So they separated it by quadrilaterals. Another student said, um, let's see, this one, well, there's different ways that you could separate them. I'm going to show you the way that I separated them and see if you can figure out what my rule is. Okay, there's one, two, and then these three. Can you figure out what my rule is that allows me to say these? Um, it's hard to see. I'm going to separate them so that you can see which, which, which ones they are. Here's this group, this group over here. What do these have in common that the other ones don't? And if you think about it, these three are all parallelograms. Parallelograms have opposite sides that are parallel. Opposite sides are congruent. This would be a rhombus, which is a parallelogram. And this one here would be a rhombus. It would be a parallelogram. Further, this one would not be. This could be a kite. This is a triangle. It is not a parallelogram. And this one, if you think about it, 
it might be a parallelogram, but it could also be an isosceles trapezoid because you're not given this length or this one. V U does not have to be the same length as T S T because it's not marked. Do not trust the way the drawing looks. Trust what trust the markings on the drawing. And so different students would explain their reason for each of these. Then we had to fix them into flexible versus versus fixed structures. I'm going to try to show you that with a with a with a rubber band. Let's see if I can make this just a little bit smaller. So here we have an isosceles isosceles triangle. These sides are the same length. I could do it like this or like this. So you can see that this is not flexible. And this is flexible. It is not rigid. So I'll put this over here in the flexible file. Here we have a rhombus. And then the rhombus, I'm going to have four sides that are the same. And if I, let's see if I make it like this. If I make it like this, like this, they're going to be the same length. So you can see that this is, I don't know if you can see this very well, but I can make this, this is flexible. This is not rigid. So, um, we have this one, which is the kite. And I'll try to make the kite here. Let's see here. If I do it like this. So here's a kite. Let's see if you can see this. In the, I'll hold it up on this, this side. Here's a kite. Here's the kite. Like this. I could make it to where this side comes up, or this side goes down. This side goes up, or this side goes down. So either way you go, this, this is also flexible. We have um, parallelogram. Parallelogram is easy to see that it's, that's, that it's a flexible. I can keep the, as long as the line, sides are parallel, it's flexible. This one, uh, I'm going to say that this one is not rigid because, and the reason is because I could have um, two sides are the same, or I could have it like this where my two sides are the same. So it could be one or the other. It is not rigid, it's flexible. The last one, however, which is this one, it is rigid. I, my side, if you used a squared plus b squared, you would get c squared, and all, all four of these, the c squared is the same. It is immovable, it cannot be moved. So this is the only one that is rigid. Not a trick question, just what you had to go. As far as these, these triangle congruence theorems, well, if we look at our cards, let's go back and look at some of the cards. I'll line them up here. Um, to use the side, side, side triangle congruence postulate, I'm, I think I'm going to use this one because, no, no, this would be the side angle side, side angle side. These two triangles are congruent. These two triangles are congruent. These two and these two are congruent. So I would use the side angle side possibly in this one. Um, I would use this one for the side angle side. I'm going to draw an auxiliary line. I mean, side, 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 side. You can prove the two triangles are congruent. You could draw an auxiliary line across this diagonal. And then the angle, side, angle. We've done that before with this one. We have the, uh, these two lines are parallel. So these two angles are alternate interior angles that are congruent. Since these two lines are parallel, these other alternate interior angles here and here are congruent. And the side is congruent to itself by the reflexive property. So by this angle, side, angle, angle, side, angle, the two triangles are congruent. So I've shown you how we can use the two different triangles to do that. Um, finally, here are four proofs that you are can match to the cards and see which one you would use to do it. And I've given you the answers here. Um, lesson synthesis. What conjectures can you make about equilateral, quadrilaterals? And to help you do that, I've given you this GeoGebra activity. And in this GeoGebra, this is um, a GeoGebra where you can make a rhombus. It is a rhombus, no matter which way you look at it. I can make it like this, like this. I can turn it. If I turn it, it's going to stay the same whatever way I turn it. And then point B does not move. But either way you go, all four sides are the same. So it could be a rhombus. Anyway, that's, and what can you say about a rhombus? Well, the diagonals are perpendicular. The diagonals bisect each other. The opposite angles are congruent. Do they have to be right angles? No, they do not. Um, and finally, let's see, where are we? 12, there's a, there's a cool down. 
which is when you would actually try to do a proof and my attribution. And that's all that I have for today. I know it's a long lesson, a lot of video, but we did a lot in class. They did a lot. So good luck and success.